we want to uh, welcome back Reverend Diane Walker today and look forward to hearing your message. Also, we welcome back our friend Christine Howard, who will be providing the music today. And I just want, for information, I'd like you to know that today is a very special birthday for Marla. Special. But she's not here, so I hope she's celebrating somewhere her special day. Happy birthday, Marla, from all of us here at Grace. Don't forget to order your name tags if you haven't done so already. And if you uh, were watching this morning, our pads of paper have arrived, and they are in the pews. And they look like this. And they're for your convenience to write any information, people's names, um, any announcements, dates and times that you need to know, and then you can just take it with you. Uh, camp decorators will be busy working on setting up this week, so be prepared for some changes downstairs when you come next Sunday. There will be no formal Sunday school for the children until September, but their activities will be available for the children. They're in a basket in the back corner on the left there, on your right, my left. Also, um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Reese McMillan for taking charge of the children each week. We really appreciate the job that you have done for us. And also a thank you to her helpers. I don't know where you are, probably resting up today, um, but thank you so much, Reese. If you would like to help out financially for Reverend Glenn's uh, trip to Korea, you can make a tax receipted gift donation um, either in the office or um, in the offering plates as you come or leave, as long as it says regarding um, Korean mission, then they will know where it's going. Today is Best Guest Sunday, for those of you that don't know what it is. Uh, downstairs, following the service in the, in the Grand Room where we have our fellowship, once a month we have a Best Guest Sunday. And all you have to do is pick a number between 1 and 100, put your name and the number on a clipboard, and somebody will win something this morning. So, just a little extra. Um, since Canada Day will be passed by the time Sunday arrives, I have a little bit of factual information for you. The longest international border in the world is shared by the United States and Canada, covering an incredible 5,525 miles of land and water. Workers regularly cut down 10 feet of trees on both sides of the boundary to make the borderline unmistakable. This lengthy ribbon of clear land called the Slash is dotted by more than 8,000 stone markers, so visitors always know where the dividing line falls. Happy Canada Day, everyone, and have a wonderful week. Good morning. It's good to be with you all again. I brought this nice weather with me from the sunny south. I live south of here. I will invite those who are lighting the Christ candle to invite the light of Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, into our gathering, our presence, and our heart. Children and fire is always a potentially exciting. Um. <laughs> Would you join me with me in the call to worship? To you, O oh God, we lift our hearts. The Lord is good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. 
So let us glorify God's holy name together. And now let's sing our faith. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts in prayer. God of grace, you created our minds to grow in wisdom. You created our hearts to expand with love for you and for your world. You created our voices to sing your praises forever. Now then, fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, bold, unafraid to follow Jesus, even when challenges confront us. In this hour of worship, assure us of your presence with us and reveal to us the path you open before us, for we live and serve as your people wherever you lead. Amen. And now let us make our confession to God in confidence of God's mercy and grace that we might be prepared to hear his word and to enter into it anew. And so we pray. God, who creates the future, you call us to follow you, yet we prefer familiar paths. You offer us new beginnings, and yet change makes us uncomfortable. You invite us into the fullness of life, yet we resist more than we already know. Forgive us, O oh God, make us courageous disciples to serve in Jesus name amen in Christ we are a new creation the old is gone new life has come trust that God loves you and forgives you and do not be afraid to make a new start amen we're going to sing and then some kids are going to come and talk to me <laughs> Yeah. 
You guys going to come talk to me? Or do you want to stare at the stage? Yeah, come on. I'm going to teach you a secret. So I want you to face these people because they're going to answer a question and they have to tell the truth. So come on up here with me. Yeah. Okay. The grown ups are going to have to answer the question. <laughs> okay. Have you guys ever had a time when somebody said you had to say you were sorry and you didn't really feel like it? Yes. Yes. Mm. Uh -huh. Let's see if they tell the truth. Have you ever had a time when you were told you had to say you were sorry, but you didn't really feel it? Let's see. Hands up. Oh, look at that. Happens to grown-ups, too. So I'm going to teach you a trick. Because being sorry and asking somebody to forgive you. It's hard, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? It's hard. So I'm going to teach you a trick. You do this, make a fist. Now, what, what do people usually do with fists? Punch. They punch. And are we supposed to do any punching? Box. No, no punching. Box, yeah. Well, box is kind of dance punching, right? OK. So make a fist. Put your skirt down. Add a girl. Make a fist. And go like this, right here. That's your solar plexus. Now, right up under here. There, push, push. Oh, come on, that's a girl fist. A real fist, that's it. Now, push. This, you're asking God to give you power. And God sends power into you, and it comes out here. And when you push, what you will feel is God's power to forgive. Okay? You won't necessarily feel like saying you're sorry. You might be really hard, but when you do this, you say, okay, God, I can't do this by myself. I can't apologize. I can't show forgiveness. I can't give it. I can't accept it. So I'm counting on you. So you do this. And let's see. All of you, come on. Push hard. Push hard. And that's the sign that you're asking the Holy Spirit to help you. Now, I'm going to be back here in a few weeks. I'm going to take, there's going to be a quiz. <laughs> and you're going, to, you're going to tell me if this works. I learned this when I was a child in Sunday school. And, uh, you know, I was a minister for a long time. That leaves in my life a lot of people to forgive. So I found that, let's see, let's try again. Push hard, push hard. And that's, that's you can feel God pushing that forgiveness into you. Okay? And when I'll be back in a few weeks, and there will be a quiz. Okay, thank you, guys. Thanks very much. Uh, scripture reading. Today's scripture is a story from the life of King David, a most important figure in the Old Testament. Some Bible scholars have suggested that David is the center point, the hinge point of the Old Testament in that everything before him leads up to him and everything that happened after is a result of him. David is the absolute high point in the history of God's chosen people the children of Israel. In his kingship, Israel attains a peace and a prosperity that became the gold standard remembered and pined for in the disastrous reigns of lesser kings who followed. David is the consummate warrior king, a gifted poet whose works are still singing today from the Book of Psalms. From his house and lineage came the savior of the world, Jesus, great David's greater son. The Lord called David a man after my own heart. But here in today's passage, we see a darker chapter in David's life. The seeds of David's own actions earlier in his life are bearing bitter fruit. His own son, Absalom, has raised up an army in rebellion against his father, the king. Now David is facing a terrible choice, what to do with a rebel son. So the scripture reading today is from 2 Samuel um, 18, verses 14 to 18, 32, and 33. 
Joab said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And 10 of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him and killed him. Then Joab sounded tr the trumpet and the troops stu stopped pursuing, excuse me, <laughs> then Joab sounded the trumpet and the troops stopped pursuing Israel for Joab halted them. They took Absalom, threw him in a big pit in the forest and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. During his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the King's Valley as a monument to himself. For he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. And he named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's Monument to this day. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. May God bless to our understanding this reading from the Holy Scriptures. Let us pray. Lord, we would ask that having heard your word as challenging and troubling a word as it is, that you would send on us your Holy Spirit to help us see the truth, the light, the hope and the power that is your intention for us to come to us through scripture. So as we consider it together, open our hearts and our minds, help us to see your presence, your power. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is, this, this is indeed a disturbing passage from the Bible, and there are lots of disturbing things in the Bible, and I think one of the most disturbing verses in the Bible is, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. This phrase, of course, comes from the Lord's Prayer, and it is a bit jarring. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. What we would expect to hear is that we should forgive the way that God forgives. That makes sense. But God forgives us, we forgive other people. But this is a twist, right, what Jesus says. It, it's not the expected. It's a twist, this prayer that God, please, please would forgive us the way that we forgive other people. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's a scary thought because I am not particularly good at forgiving people. It's not my strong suit. And my track record, and maybe your track record, on forgiving others is perhaps not so terrific either. I think that forgiveness is the spiritual issue that people are most likely to struggle with. I was at a same congregation for a long time, 17 years, and my office was upstairs in what had been the manse next to the church. And it was a badly designed, narrow, steep staircase, and I could guarantee that everybody who made it up there to talk to me was there to talk about almost always forgiveness, and it was almost always in the context of a family conflict. Forgiveness is hard. We all struggle with it. I think that forgiving and being forgiven causes people more trouble and more heartache than anything else. And I think a lot of us think, oh, surely God's forgiveness won't be an imitation of mine. Surely God can do better than that. We sure hope and pray that God won't have as much trouble forgiving us as we have at forgiving other people, or we will be in big trouble. And I want to look at this very difficult issue of forgiveness through the lens of a story. The complex 
and troubling story of King David and his son Absalom. It is a sad tale, and one of the things it is about is how hard it is to forgive within families. It's also a story about the consequences of not forgiving and how far-reaching those consequences can be. Well, King David was Israel's greatest king, the model king. God said, this is a man after my own heart. And David provided the imaginative template for the Jewish concept of the Messiah. When the Jews talked about a Messiah coming who was going to save them, everybody sort of expected he would look and sound and be like David. The Savior King that we know, the Messiah, fulfilled in Jesus, has its origins in an idea in what is now the Old Testament about Messiah. But what I think David is perhaps the best Bible truth illustration of, David is probably the, a great, terrific illustration of the truth that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. David is a powerful reminder that no matter how good a life we think we have lived, no matter how religious and devoted, none of us is perfect. The very best of us messes up and does things that cause suffering for other people, sometimes on purpose, sometimes inadvertently. David reminds us that no matter who else we are, no matter what else we are, we are sinners. Who, had fallen, who have fallen short of the glory of God. Now, David had many children from his many wives and many concubines, and Absalom was David's third oldest son. To understand what happened with Absalom as a young man, we have to go back in the story to a time when Absalom was a little boy. David was at the height of his power and success, he ruled over the greatest empire that the Israelites had ever possessed before or since. David was on top of the world. But David's power started to go to his head. He started to think that he was not like other mortals, that because he was so powerful, that if he wanted something, he could and should have it. And what he wanted when Absalom was a little boy was a beautiful woman called Bathsheba. Now, the only problem with Bathsheba was that she was married to Uriah, one of David's most loyal military leaders. David saw what he wanted, and he had Bathsheba brought to his bed. And later, when she sent word to David that she was pregnant, this caused a crisis because Uriah had been away in battle for longer than could be explained away. David decided he needed to get Uriah out of the way, so he arranged for the man to be killed in battle, and then David took Uriah's wife Bathsheba as his wife. David thought he had been so clever that no one would ever know what he had done. And no one did, except God. God knew. As the story reports, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. The thing that David did displeased the Lord. So God sends to David the prophet Nathan. And he's there to tell David a story. A story about two men, one very rich and one very poor. The rich man had huge flocks of sheep and goats. The poor man had just one little lamb that he treated as if it were his own child, carried it around. When the rich man wanted to give a feast, a dinner party, he, stored the, he stole the poor man's one little lamb and didn't want to take one of his own. He took what wasn't his to take. When David heard this story from Nathan, his sense of justice was outraged, and David cried out, the man who did this deserves to die. You're right, said Nathan. You are the man. The wrong David did to Uriah was far greater in God's eyes than any sheep stealing. David stood there, 
condemned by his own words. Well, the story goes on to show how the ripple effects of what, had, of what David had done radiated through the whole family in ever-growing circles. And that's often what happens, isn't it? We make a decision, we make a choice, and then the effects are felt far into the future, sometimes even for generations. I lived in a small town, and about a decade after, excuse me, about a decade before my family moved there, the town had been rocked by a scandal. Two couples, I'm going to call them Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, <laughs> these two couples became very close and they started to do all their vacationing together and they started to spend all their time together. And you know what's coming next, right? Yeah. Bob started to have an affair with Alice and he left his wife Carol to marry her. The two abandoned spouses consoled each other and they ended up marrying as well. This switch of couples left the five kids they had between them to pick up the pieces. But this scandal had an effect on the whole town. One of these two men was one of the town's two doctors. After the switch, when the dust had settled, his new wife decided she didn't want to live in that little town anymore with all of those ghosts. So they moved to the city. And that affected all the patients of that doctor. Both couples had been active in some community groups like the curling club, but they had also, both couples, been very active at the couples club at the United Church. And the club never really recovered from that scandal. It all kind of fell apart from that point on. So I arrived, as they say, about 10 years after all this had happened. As I watched the fallout from these events, almost a decade later, I know that it affected me personally. It made me perpetually cautious of the potential threat to marriages when one couple starts spending all their time with another couple. When decisions are made in a moment like that affair did, the effects can be felt for years, for even generations to come. It affected me, and I didn't get there till 10 years after it had happened. And you see, that's what happened to Absalom. He was a boy who grew up with a father who took what he wanted at any cost. Absalom grew up, he was a very handsome, he had this beautiful long flowing hair which turned out to be his undoing. Absalom grew up to be a very handsome but a very troubled young man. Well Absalom had a half brother called Amnon, same father, different mothers. Amnon was David's oldest son, so he was the heir apparent to the throne. Amnon became infatuated with his beautiful half-sister, Tamar, who was Absalom's full sister. One day, Amnon, unable to control his lust, lured Tamar to his room and forced her into his bed. When he heard what had happened to his sister Tamar, Absalom was outraged. And he did what was very common in that culture. To avenge the dishonor done to his sister Tamar, Absalom killed Amnon. And of course, then Absalom has to go into exile and hide. He'd murdered the heir to the throne. Well, you know, time passes. And David was persuaded to allow Absalom to come home. He was allowed to return to Jerusalem, but he was not allowed to see the king, David. Absalom got his home back, but he lost his father. David's heart was hardened against Absalom. Now, I'm sure that David thought he was doing the right thing. He was teaching Absalom a lesson, and you can bet the neighbors all said, well, you know, Absalom should consider himself lucky that he got away with his life, and he was allowed to come back. David was going to let him back, but not completely. And he sure was not going to let him off the hook too easily. 
But this decision of David's to shut Absalom out of palace life proved to be a very devastating decision. Absalom was offended, hurt, angry, and he organized a rebellion, an armed rebellion, to overthrow David and to seize the throne. David, that great and powerful king, was in this awful dilemma and had to stand by helplessly as the soldiers hunted down the young man Absalom. As Absalom was riding along on his donkey, all that beautiful hair got caught in the branches of a low hanging tree. And as he hung there helpless, David's men found him and mercilessly killed him. David was crushed. He knew that he was to blame for Absalom's death, but it was too late. The streets of Jerusalem echoed with David's inconsolable cries, Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom. And the whole thing is tragic, isn't it? David takes what is not his in order to have the beautiful Bathsheba. He arranges to have her husband killed. Absalom sees this, and he is affected by it. And isn't that the truth for every parent, that eventually we are faced with the harsh reality that our kids are watching us and that they are listening to us, that they learn more about what we do, about who we are from what we do than what we say. We want our children to learn good things from us, but they learn the not-so-good stuff from us too. And you know, in this story, Amnon and Absalom are both chips off the old block, David. They saw their father take what he wanted, and so the sons took what they wanted too. Amnon took Tamar's body for his own pleasure, and Absalom sought to take the kingdom away from his father. Well, you might be wondering what this whole tragic story has to do with forgiveness. Forgiveness is an uplifting topic, but this story about the sins of one generation being visited on the next, this story is a real downer. But if you read this story in the context of the whole Bible, which is what you have to do with every story in the Bible, right? You have to read it in the context of the whole Bible message. I don't think it, that it is really that much of a downer. The reason the story of David and Absalom, the reason that it's in the Bible, the Word of God, is because it gives us a vantage point to understand not just ourselves and not just our amazing ability to make all kinds of problems for ourselves. It also shows the astounding grace of God. I often think when I read a story like this was, how did this make the cut? Why didn't this get suppressed? Why didn't this get hidden? That's one of the reasons you can trust the Bible so much, you know, because there's such tough stuff in it. So this story, it sets the table for a great deal of what comes later. And I see that there's this underground spring that feeds the great and expanding river of the message of God's forgiving love. This is a story about forgiveness. It's a story about letting our hearts be tender enough to receive God's word to us, to acknowledge our pain over our failings and to be open to the restoration and healing that comes to us in Christ. One of the great messages of this story is that we are all in this together. St. Paul put it like this, there is no one who is righteous, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now you could see that as a very negative message, but we can also be really encouraged by it because it means it's not just me, that struggles with all this stuff. And it's not just you, it's all of us. David was a king 
a mighty and powerful king, but he was not God. Even the great King David, a man after God's own heart, stood before the Lord God in the same place where we all stand. David did not get to define for himself what was right and what was wrong. And no matter how hard he tried, he could not hide the truth about himself. David was not God in the way that he sinned, but he was also not God in the way that he forgave. He let Absalom come back to Jerusalem, but he didn't let him, he didn't let the boy back into his own life. On the surface, David appeared to forgive Absalom, but there was a great big alienating invisible wall that stood between them. And isn't that the way it often is, right? We say we forgive, but just not all the way. We say, oh, I, I, forget, I forget, it's all in the past. But of course it's not. We make these forgiving noises with our mouths. That's why it helps to hurt yourself a little bit when you forgive. Reminder of what it's costing you. And when we don't forgive fully, and I know as much about this as everyone else in this room, because I am really not good at this, when we don't forgive fully, we deprive ourselves of the blessing that forgiveness is intended to give to us, and that blessing is a healed and restored relationship. If you don't forgive all the way, you don't get all the healing. You don't get all the restoration. What we, did, what we often have a tendency to do instead is to keep the memory of the hurt close by nursing it and tending it and keeping it alive and rehearsing over in our minds all the details of it so that we can take that hurt and pull it out whenever we want to score some points against the person who hurt us or somebody else. Now, I, I know that there is way more to the problem of forgiveness than this, and I know that forgiveness has as many shades and variations as there are relationships. We all know that there are times when we say, I want to be reconciled. I do. I, I even want to move on. But what if he or she can't admit that what they did was wrong, what they did to me was wrong? Well, that's a real issue, issue a lot of us wrestle with. That's a sermon for another day. What we're doing today is to wrap our minds around the forgiveness that God has. The forgiveness that came to David. David was not let off the hook. David was not told what you did was okay, don't worry about it. David had to pay the price of his own sins and even the sins of his children. David had to pay the price. But God's love for David was abundant and ever renewed and at the very end of his life, when he's a very old man and he needs to have a little slave girl in the bed with him to keep his feet warm, even then David knows that he lives within the love and forgiveness of God. We want to understand God's forgiveness towards us so that when we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, we need to know what we're asking. God's forgiveness is not letting people off scot-free or saying it doesn't matter what we do. God's forgiveness is only and always about healing broken relationships. God forgives us so that we can forgive others. And without forgiveness, there is no healing of the broken relationships that litter so many of our lives, like somebody emptied out the paper shredder and missed the bag. Why did Jesus say it like this, making it sound like God's forgiveness is modeled on ours rather than the other way around? I think, I'm guessing, I think it was to get our attention. When we are told you should forgive the way that God forgives, 
It's so easy to brush it off and say, yeah, yeah, sure, I know that. But maybe Jesus wanted us to be jolted awake every single time we say those words. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Jolted awake so that we ask, what exactly am I doing when I say that I forgive someone? Am I giving myself a little push in the solar plexus? Am I really doing that? And when we give ourselves that little push and say, I don't want to, and I'm not entirely sure I can, but I know I have to, forgive him, forgive her. And that little push should lead us to this question. Where would I be if God was no better at forgiving than I am? Where would I be if God was no better at forgiving than I am? So that little push in your solar plexus, that can be a rediscovery, rediscovering a new, all over again, the great joy that God's forgiveness is not like our forgiveness. That God's forgiveness is wider and deeper and higher than ours. And when we look at God's forgiveness, the forgiveness that went to the cross and paid the price, when we look at that forgiveness extended towards us, that gives us the courage to say, I, I, I think I can. I think this is the model for me to forgive as I have been forgiven. So that our forgiveness takes cue from God's forgiveness towards us. And through it all, we've got this wonderful grace. We know that even when our forgiveness falls short and we can only make sounds with our lips but nothing's happened in the heart, even when our forgiveness fails, God's never does. And that is grace enough and plenty for today. Amen? So let's sing about it. Remember, at Bethel Stone Church from 1989 to 1996. And so, Carrie, play those folks in my heart. I went back 25 years later to preach at an anniversary service, and I said, So it's 25 years since I left. I haven't changed a bit, and neither have you, right? <laughs> and everybody agreed to my rich and deep fantasy life. So, one of the realest things in our lives, though, is prayer. You know, so many conversations we have are superficial and meaningless. And they're instrumental. They're to get us to what we need, what we want. But prayer is the exact opposite of instrumental, rela of rela instrumental relationships, something you use to get what you want. 
Prayer is true conversation. It is opening ourselves by the grace of God to the presence of God that is already with us. You know the, the famous uh, painting, and you've seen it in many stained glass windows, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and Jesus is knocking on that door. And you've seen that image lots of times. You know, there's no handle on the door. The handle's only on the inside. Look the painting up. It's by uh, Burne Jones, one of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Jesus is knocking. There's no exterior door handle. Jesus can't come in. The handle's on the inside. Let's open the door. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you in this time of prayer. We have great thanksgiving for all your many and manifold blessings in our lives. And we especially thank you today for the summer season, which is upon us. We thank you for the release from school that it brings for children and teachers and administrators and we pray that the summer season of renewal before return to learning will be a time of restoration and joy. We pray for parents who will now have a little more time with their children than perhaps is entirely manageable. And we pray for your grace and mercy on them. We pray, too, with this summer season for family gatherings and reunions and seeing old friends and uh, ask that your, your presence season our conversation, that uh, you will teach us to love one another as you have loved us. And we pray, then, for traveling mercies, for protection, for people doing unfamiliar things and in unfamiliar places and pray that uh, your presence will bring uh, protection, wisdom, caution, and sense. We thank you too that we live in a time and a place of such bounty. As the season turns from rhubarb to strawberries to raspberries and sweet corn, and we make our way through all the delights. We pray for those who produce our food, who worry about frost and wrestle with the bank and struggle to find the staffing help they need. We pray for all who produce our food with gratitude and ask you to prosper and defend their work. We thank you, God, for all the everyday blessings of our lives, for the people we love and the people who love us, whether they live with us or are a distant, live a distant from us or, or who live only in our memory. We thank you for this gift of love that um, enriches our lives beyond measure, and we ask you to teach us the wisdom to protect and to encourage these family relationships. Even so, we thank you for the gift of friendship and uh, pray that you will make us better friends and less bitter enemies. We pray for places where there is need for the sick, whom we name in our hearts before you. We pray for those who watch with the dying, we pray for the bereaved, for all who mourn, that they might know your comfort. We pray for places of need all around the world. We pray for the people of Russia in their time of great political, military turmoil. Bring peace to their land, Lord, and freedom. We pray for the people of the Ukraine in the weariness of defending their land. We pray for, their, for places where there are fires and severe weather, political instability, hunger, corruption. Lord, bring your peace, bring your reign upon the earth. 
We pray for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. And we remember those down the road at Bethel Stone Church and their pastor, Adrian. You know what burdens, personal burdens, we carry with us here this morning, Lord. The things we're worried about and the things we're afraid of. And so we gather them all together and sing the prayer that you have taught us. We are grateful that God has blessed us so abundantly that we can bless his work in this place through our offerings. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, make us ever more generous, ever less fearful about giving, of falling short, of there not being enough. Teach us a generosity of spirit on the offering plate and in the forgiving ministries of our own lives. Take what we have, what we are, Use it according to your will and purpose, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Thank you. 
So the best blessing I can give you today is to think about somebody you need to forgive, even a dead person, and pray for forgiveness today. And think about maybe who you need to offer an apology, a word to, and to seek forgiveness. These are wonderful blessings. Jesus gave them to us. Let's take them. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and abide with you this day and always. Amen. Will clap their hands. 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 Will clap